Hey guys, finally there. It's the last two chapters of Maniac McGee. Well, I think there's actually three chapters, but it's going to be the last video of Maniac McGee. And we finally reached the end together. So I'm going to start today, chapter 44. The last time we saw Maniac McGee, or Jeffrey, if you will, uh, was when... He had realized that he could sleep in the different backyards, different things like that. So the very last paragraph from the last chapter. From then on, he slept in a different backyard or back porch every night. Once, finding the back door unlocked, he slept in a kitchen. Chapter 44. One morning in early July, cruising down the apple skin hour, Maniac thought he heard footsteps other than his own. He stopped. Only the vast quietness responded. It happened a few more times. Must be his own footfalls echoing, echoing down the row house canyons. Two days later, passing an alley, he thought someone moved at the other end. And once, turning onto a broad street, he had the feeling, more sense than sight, that something had just flashed around a corner two blocks away. When these odd sensations continued, for another morning or two, Maniac knew he was not alone. He was not totally surprised when, a few mornings later, he turned a corner and ran smack into another early hour cruiser. No, it wasn't the what that surprised him. It was the who. Mars Bar Thompson. They quickly bounced off each other and went their separate ways. Neither paused. Neither said a word. This was the first in a series of apparently random mergings. Intersections, alleyways, one never knew when he would come upon the other. Sometimes they found themselves running the same route, only a block apart. On one occasion, they trotted down the same street at the same time in the same direction, but on opposite sides of the street. And then one day, as it happened, they each turned a particular corner at the same moment and headed off in the same direction, side by side. Still, neither spoke, not even their eyes met. They jogged silently for a block, then veered apart. The next time they dovetailed, they stayed that way for two blocks, then three blocks, and so on. No words, no looks, just the rhythmic slapping of their sneaker soles upon the sidewalk and the pulsing duet of their breathing. Stride for stride, shoulder to shoulder, breath for breath, till they were matching on all points. A harnessed pair, two runners become one. <clears throat> morning after morning, it happened this way. The two of them dovetailing at an intersection and, without the slightest hitch and stride, cruising off together. Though each face showed no awareness of the other, they were in fact minutely sensitive to each other. If Mars Bars cranked up the speed, uh, cranked up the pace just a notch, Maniac would pick it up within a stride. If Maniac inched ahead, Mars Bar was there. If one veered to the left or right, the other followed like a shadow. One day one was the leader, the next day the other. One day Mars Bar would lead Maniac down the river down the tracks, past the railroad gondolas, each with its mountain of coal, to the rolling mill at the street plant where his father worked. Another day, Maniac would head for the township to the north and west, the farmlands of the country where dew sparkled on spider webs, and nature was doing such fresh and wonderful things that you could almost hear a long, Neat congregations of corn clapping, Amen and Amen. When the working people began leaving their houses and daybreak, boys diverged. Mars Bar to the East End, Maniac to wherever. A week passed. A second week. Morning after morning. Stride for stride. Breath for breath. Never a word. Never a glance each believing the other simply happened to be going where he was going. They were cruising Main Street one morning, passing the grand movie theater, when Piper McNabb came screeching down the middle of the empty street. 
He was wild-eyed and crying and soaking wet. His feet were slathered in coal-black mud. He shrieked and babbled at them, but he made no sense. So they just followed as he raced frantically back up the street. As they ran, the belch-like toot of a whistle grew louder and louder. He led them to the corner of Maine and Swede, to where the platform of the P&W trolley terminal hung high above the sidewalk. He burst into the terminal building and up the steps. In a moment, Maniac and Mars Bar were on the platform, a gasping and following Piper's pointing finger down the track. What they saw pulled the fragments of Piper's babble together. The boys had been playing bombs away. Piper's part was to sail the raft down the river. Russell's part was to wait on the trolley trestle that spanned the river. And when Piper passed underneath, bomb away from a bucket full of rocks. Everything went as planned, unless you count Russell failing to sink the raft and Piper's practically drowning trying to beach it until Piper returned to the terminal to find Russell still out on the trestle. Apparently, without the target below to focus on, Russell had suddenly discovered how high he was. One false step and he could slip right between the ties to the river. And that's where Russell was now, out in the middle of the trestle, higher up the water, frozen in terror, not even a railing to cling to, responding neither to Piper's cry nor to the red and yellow P&W trolley, which also occupied the trestle, idling and tooting about 20 feet away. Maniac Piper pulled at Maniac, save him, save him. Mars Bars stared with growing astonishment at Maniac, whose wide, unblinking eyes were fixed on the trestle, yet somehow did not seem to register what was there. Nor did he seem to hear Piper pleading with the drenched, mud-footed kid clawing at him. He turned without a word, without a gesture, and left the platform and went downstairs. Shortly, he appeared on the sidewalk below. He crossed Main and continued walking slowly up Swede, Piper screaming after him from the end of the platform. Chapter 45. McGee! McGee! Maniac's first groggled thought was that it was the buffalo calling to him. Then he thought, it's the superintendent. He's discovered me and he's come to kick me out. He propped himself up on his elbow, swatted a straw from his ear, and gave a better listen. McGee! McGee! Mars bar. It was the second night following the morning at the trestle. Maniac had been asleep in the buffalo, buffalo lean-to. He stood. McGee! Where are you? Here, over here. He headed toward the voice over the hoof-chopped earth. The moon was full. He could see Mars Bar's dark form against the fence. Then he could see his eyes. What are you doing here? I've been looking for you. Heard you hung out here. Where did you hear that? Amanda Beale? You really sleep here, man? What do you want? Where's the buffaloes? Can't see them. They're sleeping. Like every other person that's got sense. What are you doing out here at this time of night? I snuck out. I'm not I'm not there when they wake up. They'll figure I'm out running like usual. Ain't you afraid in there? No. They both fell silent. Cricket talk. And fireflies held the night. McGee? Yeah? I got something to ask you. Go ahead. Why'd you... Why didn't you go after the kid? Why'd you go away? The maniac didn't answer. Listen, man, I know you wasn't scared. I know it. So I had to come ask you. Maniac's voice came faintly. Is he okay? I asked you first. Maniac drew a long breath. You want to come in? 
Arspar laughed. You kidding? Ain't no buffalo gonna eat this dude. They don't eat people. Well, you come out here, man. Maniac climbed the fence. He started to walk. Marsbar walked with him. Maniac told him the story of his parents' death. He told about his problem with the trestle, how he'd learned to avoid it. And then, all of a sudden, there I was, on the platform, looking out at it, closer to it than I ever was before, up on the same level. I always saw it from below before. Now I was up there, too, where they were, looking down, and it was more real than ever. The nightmare was worse than ever. I saw the trolley coming. I saw it falling. Them, them. They walked in silence past the silo-shaped cage of the broken-winged golden eagle. Marsbar swallowed hard. His voice was hoarse. Well, I knew you wasn't scared. Maniac sniffed. I don't remember much. Next thing I knew, I was somewhere on Swede Street. Somebody come down the east end like you did, all by himself, a fish belly, get up all in my face. He rippled a stick along the deer pen fence. I knew scared wasn't it. So, said Maniac, what happened? Marsbar laughed, wagged his head. Happened? Man, I still don't believe it. He rippled the fence. That little honky? He looks at me, all his crybaby face, and says, Okay, can I go out and get his brother? I look around like, Somebody else here? I says to him, Who are you talking to? Me? I'm just pulling his chain, only he don't know it. Because I'm tickled a little, you know? Because there he was hollering for you up the street, and there I am standing right alongside the darn stupid white potato, understanding what I'm saying? Maniac nodded. Out of the darkness came the strangest sound. Kind of an amplified gulp. Marsbar jumped. What's that? Emu, Maniac said. There. Behind the nearest fence loomed a tall, thin neck topped by a small head. E what? Emu. Second largest bird in the world after the ostrich. They're from Australia. I don't remember studying about no emu. You buddies with all these dudes? No, just the buffalo. So go ahead, what happened? What happened? Marshbar snorted. What happened was, I went out and rescued the dumb fish. I'd like to get myself killed. Maniac touched Marsbar's arm. He's okay? Marsbar snickered. Yeah, he's okay. But that ain't the main part. The main part is how he was all grabbing on to me, coming off them tracks, shaking, shivering, hugging, like he wanted to climb inside me. I was afraid, he shook his head, giggled, afraid the fish belly was going to kiss me. They laughed. Maniac tried to picture it, the two of them making their way across the trestle, tie by tie, arms wrapped around each other. And that ain't even the mainest part, said Mars Bar, his voice rising in wonder. Even when we got off, the midget wouldn't let me go. We're off it, I says to him. You're rescued. But all he does is grab me harder, like an octopus or something. Off the platform, down the steps, out to the street, he's still doing it. I couldn't pry him off, no how. So, said Maniac, what did you do? What did I do? I took him home. Maniac stopped dead. What? Mars Bar shrugged. Figured that my mom pry him off me. Of course, the other one had to come too. But I made him leave them muddy sneakers outside. He put his nose to a fence. What's in there? I don't see nothing. Prairie dog town. They're underground. So what then? So my mom, my mother took over. She pried the one off me. And soon she does, he jumps right on her like an octopus. I gotta pull him off, and she gets all mad at me and says, let him go, let him go. She gets the wet one dried off, takes his clothes, and puts my old stuff on him. Stuff she's been saving, in case I get a little brother someday. But I won't. 
because my mom can't have no babies no more. And I ain't even come to the craziest part yet. Well, what's that? They didn't want to go home. They stayed all day. My mother's babying them, beat them. I tell her not to. She swats me away. Sometimes my mom ain't got no sense. She makes me play games with them. Monopoly and stuff? Ugh. Finally, my father drives him home. It's after dark. We're getting out of the car. You know what they say to me? I'm in the car, too. He waggled his head. They asked me to come in and play that game of theirs. Rebels. They, like, beg me. They say, come on, please. If you play with us, we'll let you be white. You believe that? Maniac chuckled. I believe it. They walked on. Boogie? Yeah? I had to ask you something. I gotta tell you something. What's that? You smell like buffalo. Ears of a hundred different shapes prickled at the long, loud laughter of the boys. McGee, Mars Bar said after a spell. Yeah. My mother wants to ask you something, too. Your mother? Yeah. Like I told her about you, you know. Actually, she already heard about you. So? So she wants to know, like, uh... Why don't you come to our house? Maniac turd, turned, stared directly at Mars Bar. Mars Bar looked away. He said nothing more. They walked on, silent among the crickets and fireflies. Having made a full circle of the zoo, they were back at the pen of the American bison. Maniac said, I can't. Why not? said Mars Bar. My house not good enough? My mother? Maniac struggled for words. I, I didn't say I didn't want to. I just, I don't know, things happen. I can't. Look, man, Mars Bar snapped. Ain't nobody gonna saying, come live with us. All we saying, all, all she's saying is, you wanna come for a little, you know, visit? You want to? Well, come on, you can that's all. Don't go making no big thing, man. Ain't no big thing. Maniac shuddered. His eyes turned to the sky, beyond the flickering fireflies to the stars. If there were answers, they were as far away as the constellations. I gotta go. Before Mars Bar could react, he was over the fence and hurrying for the lean-to. Chapter 46. The teeth of the buffalo clamped firmly upon his ear and lifted his head up from the straw, up from sleep. Mars Bar was right. They do eat people. The buffalo did more than bring great pain to his ear. It spoke to him. Ain't you nice? Ain't you nice? But the voice of the buffalo was the voice of Amanda Beale, and its teeth were her fingers pulling and retching his poor ear till it was till he was sitting upright. See that? She snapped and scrambled his brains with a smack to the head. He'd rather she pulled on his ear. There you go, making me say ain't. I have not said that word all year long, and now you go making me so mad she snatched a handful of straw and flung it at him. I'm sorry, he said. He wondered if he could have better luck sleeping in the emu pen. Can I ask a question? Make it quick, she growled. Except for making you say ain't, what is it I'm saying I'm sorry for? What? she screeched. She was standing above him, hands on hips. He didn't need the light of day to feel the look on her face. You're sorry for a whole mess of things, boy. You're sorry because you didn't accept Snickers' invitation to his house. 
and you're sorry because he came throwing a ball up against my bedroom window and waking me up and telling me I had to get up out of my bed and sneak out of my house in the middle of the night and come out here and do something about all this. That is why you're sorry, boy. Maniac yawned. Snickers? That's what I'm changing his name to. How bad can you act if everyone's calling you, she said it loud, Snickers. A voice came rasping from the fence. Shut up, girl. Maniac howled with laughter. It struck him that it had been a long time since he had reared back like this, so he just let the laughter carry on as long as it wanted. When he finally settled down, Amanda said, Okay, let's go. Huh? said Maniac. Let's go. Where? Home. Whose? Mine. Yours. Ours. Come on, I'm sleepy. Oh no. Maniac opened his mouth to speak, to protest, to explain. But there was too much. A hundred nights would not be long enough to explain, to make her understand. So we simply said, I can't, and lay back down. In an instant, he was bolt upright again, yanked by a hand he couldn't believe belonged to a girl. Don't tell me can't. I didn't come all the way out here in my nightshirt and my slippers and climb that fence and almost kill myself so I could hear you tell me can't. She was yelling. Several pens away, Prairie Dog Town stirred. Heads popped up in the moonlight. You got it all wrong, Buster. You ain't got... Oh, see? She kicked him. You do not have a choice. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. You are coming home with me, and you are going to sleep in my room, which is going to be your room, and I don't care if you sleep on the floor or the windowsill or what, but you are going to sleep there and not here, and you're going to sleep there tonight and tomorrow night and the night after that and the night after that and every night, except maybe once in a while if you decide to sleep over at Snicker's house, if he ever asks you again. This is not your home. Now move. She jerked him to his feet. Applause and a brief whistle came from the fence. Amanda led him by the hand across the muddy, lumpy earth. Boost me, she commanded at the fence. He boosted her. Mars Bar helped her down from the other side. Maniac hesitated then climbed over himself. They walked through the zoo and down the boulevard, the three of them, Amanda and Mars Bar slash Snickers and Maniac. Amanda grumbling all the way. For more trouble outside the house than in it. Now I've got to throw away these slippers, probably buffalo poop all over them, and you better not come within 10 feet of me, boy, till you get a bath. Maniac said nothing. He was quite content to let Amanda do the talking, for he knew that behind her grumbling was all that he had ever wanted. He knew that finally, truly, at long last, someone was calling him home. And that is the end of our book. Oh. Such a good book. And I love the ending. I love that Amanda just goes out and rips him a new one with Mars Bar getting the new name of Snickers. I think Amanda was right. You can't be very bad when your nickname is Snickers. Great book. I really wish that someday they'd write a second one to keep going on it. But they didn't. Oh, apparently... That's our time together. My phone has just announced that I have something else I need to do. So, the next book is going to be the book Holes. Um, I've got it right here. The book Holes by a gentleman named Louis Sakar. Uh, this is a, an amazing book. Mrs. Baldwin and I have talked about it. We're going to try and take turns reading it to you. 
there's going to be some pretty cool stuff that I'm hoping we can do with this book. So until that starts and until I see you again, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. I love you. I'll see you soon.